Radio, let's pray. Lord, I thank you that your word speaks to us, that when we open your Bible, your spirit continues to pour out truth. And I pray that as we do that together, we would learn something of your love for us, something of your mission and mandate over us, and we'd be excited for all that you've called us to be and to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Now at high school, when I was at high school, I had a knack um, for getting in trouble. I had quite a talent, uh, to be honest. Um, Now please believe me, especially if you're a teacher in the room, that when I say that, it wasn't because I was always naughty, like honestly. It was, it was because I was always there. Do you know what I mean? Like, whenever the, wherever the trouble was, I was kind of there. And so I got caught a lot. And so when there was a fight happening, I'd just kind of be there. Or if there was some other chaos going on, I was just always there. It felt like that I was kind of some magnet of negative stuff that was going on at school. I always felt that I was often in the corridor or the senior teacher's office a lot more than I was actually in the classroom. I used to pace my way down the classroom, uh, down the corridor, saying, the injustice of this, it's just not fair. I was just happened to be there. It's not my fault at all. But do you ever feel like you just, um, a ridiculous amount of bad things are happening to you all at once? Does anyone ever feel like that? Does anyone ever feel like these things are just stacking up and it just seems like I'm receiving all the bad stuff all the time? In the summer of 2018, me and my wife had the worst summer ever. We call it the summer of our discontent. It was like the worst summer. Um, someone very close to me tried to take their own life and then a week later a good friend of mine who I led to Jesus died in a horrific car accident which left his wife and two very small children behind and then one of Laura's grandparents died and then um, our dog died and then our house was burgled all in the same summer and at the end of that summer we were supposed to go to Spain on holiday with the kids And I looked at our bank balance and I was like, we spent so much money on petrol visiting loads of people who are sick or unwell. And we spent loads of money on hotels visiting those people who are sick and unwell. Then it got to the end of the summer holidays. Like, I've got no money even for an ice cream in Spain. Like, and we weren't even all inclusive. We had just got an Airbnb. So I was like, I don't know what we're going to do. We've got no no pesetas to to rub together. Do you know what I mean? And, um, but sometimes feels like, doesn't it, that our lives are a bit like that. Like it just feels like something is going from bad to worse all the time. And we're just attracting all this negative stuff going on. The thing is, when I became a Christian when I was 17, I thought becoming a Christian meant freedom from pain, freedom from, from suffering, freedom from hardship, and freedom from heartache, right? And sometimes we think that so many bad things are happening to us all at once. And psychologists call this a frequency illusion, right? And the idea is this, that actually more bad things are happening to you all in the space of a short period of time and you're starting to notice negativity everywhere. It's a bit like this, when someone is pregnant or, or you might be pregnant and you start noticing babies everywhere. Or you might have just got some Lucy and Yak dungarees and you start noticing them everywhere, right? I mean, it's not an illusion, is it, in this church? It's everywhere. But I remember when I first got a Vauxhall Sephira with a roof rack, right, which is a proper dad car. It's got seven seats, roof rack, solid car. And I started seeing them everywhere. I was like, I never knew so many, uh, so many Vauxhall Zafiras existed. But sometimes we see that, our, our brains see all those things happening and we think they never happened before. Psychologists say that this frequency illusion is actually made up of a couple of components. One is this, selective attention. And our brains have this amazing way of focusing in on one or two things. It's like you can read in a park, and even while there's all kinds of things going on, you can actually immerse yourself into the world of Tolkien, for example. But we start to notice patterns, so if one thing happens, our brain immediately links those things together. We start to think things like, well, we're we're going into debt because I didn't care properly for my aunt who was ill, right? (laughs) This one thing that happened must be linked to this other negative thing that's happening. Or we might think this relationship that I'm in is breaking up because I cheated on a test at school. Of course, that's not why it's happening. Those two things aren't linked, but our brain makes those patterns and says uh, and says they're linked. And the other component to this frequency illusion is this confirmation bias, and that's the idea that our brains want to find evidence for the thing that we already agree with. Who's writing a dissertation at the moment? Anyone put their hand up or writing an essay of any kind? A couple of you doing proper degrees, right? Um, now, there's probably not a, and I, I, I've got three degrees, and I, I don't think there was a single essay that I started that I didn't already think that I knew the conclusion of before, right, at the end. I started every single essay think, knowing what I was going to write in the conclusion. I just found all the books to actually suggest the right thing, found all the right quotes to actually steer my uh, essay towards that thing. We find all the evidence to support the thing that we already 
agree with. And so you might think, you might think in, inherently that you're a bad person. Therefore, I deserve bad things to happen to me. And so I see those things and I think that they're happening to me. You might think, well, it feels as if like, I'm going through some stuff and I just deserve to have all these bad things happening. And so, of course, I deserve all this bad stuff. I deserve all this debt. I deserve that diagnosis. I deserve this relationship to break up. Well, why does this matter? Well, because when you start to follow Jesus, spoiler alert, your life isn't full of rainbows and daisies all of a sudden. The improvement Jesus gives to our life is not always qualitative. We can't always stack it up and count it. Sometimes our lives continue to feel like Travis's, why does it always rain on me? Sometimes it feels like Alanis Morissette's ironic, which is, isn't actually ironic, is it, that song? It's just a series of bad things. But sometimes our life feels like that. We can't always measure the goodness of God. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, how do we keep going when things get tough? And so far, we're in uh, the, the book of Acts, but what's happened is Jesus died on Good Friday, rose again on Easter Sunday, and then he ascended into heaven and left his disciples with one command, to go and wait in Jerusalem until I send my spirit. Acts 2, we see the spirit falling on, on all people that are gathered there. And then what happens is Peter and John are walking on their, way to pray for, on their way to go and pray at the temple. And they meet a guy who's been disabled from birth. And they say to this guy, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the man gets up and walks. And the problem is, is he wants to hang around with them. And so they walk into the synagogue with this guy who's, who's like clinging onto them for dear life. And everyone who's walked past this guy for 40 years recognizes him because they've walked past him every day on the way to pray. And they say there's something about this Jesus that isn't just about nice ideas and nice theories. But actually what we're seeing here is these theories and this nice stuff is actually becoming enfleshed in this person who's now jumping and dancing and praising God who we used to try and avoid on our way to church. So suddenly the theories and the ideas about Jesus have got a bit fleshy. And it gets problematic because Jesus is no longer an, uh, an interesting idea. The idea of the resurrection is no longer just a theory. Suddenly it has legs and it dances in the middle of synagogues. And so we're now, now what then happens is Peter and John have been preaching about what's happening to this guy and people are starting to get upset. So we pick up the story in Acts 4 from verse 1. It says this. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. Now, if you're reading this in the time that it was written, a bit like a pantomime, when you hear certain characters, you go, boo. When you hear certain characters, you go, yay. And, and like we've got the priests, and they were kind of like, yeah. But the priests were like the worship leaders of the time. The captain of the temple guard, they were like the police of the, of the temple. And if you broke certain laws in the temple, you could be put in prison, and there was a prison inside the temple itself. And then we have the Sadducees who were like leaders of the law. So you've got all these people, they come up to Peter and John, they're heavies, come up to Peter and John while they're speaking to the people. Remember who they're coming up to, Peter and John. Just about a month before, Peter was the guy who Jesus said, you're gonna betray me. He's like, no, I wouldn't, Jesus, not in a million years. We're buddies, no way, we've got to see Grand Shea. He's like, no, you're going to betray me. And then what happens? Jesus gets arrested, and Peter runs in the opposite direction. And we're told that three times he's warming himself by a fire. And people say, do you know that guy, Jesus? He's like, no, I don't, I don't know him at all. Do you know that guy, Jesus? And then it's a little girl who runs up to him and says, I've seen you with Jesus. And it freaks him out, and he runs in the other direction. So he's betrayed Jesus. And then with him, we've got John. And John's kind of like the fluffy one of the group. He loves Jesus. He's like, he rests his head against Jesus' uh, chest at one point, we're told. He's the guy who calls himself the one whom Jesus loved the most when he writes his... I mean, if I was writing a gospel, I would certainly put that too, right? I'm the, I'm the proper one. Do you know what I mean? The, the other 11, they're all right, but I'm the one who Jesus loved the most. And so we've got these two. And they're surrounded by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees. And we're told this. Those guys were greatly disturbed because the apostles, Peter and John, were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who would believed grew to about 5,000. Now, we're told the, um, the number of men who believed because in the, at this part of the temple, only men were allowed. 
And so about, um, it grew to about 5,000 people started to believe. Now, why did so many who hear the message believe? Well, some of them may have seen the resurrected Jesus because Jesus appeared to about 500 people when he had resurrected. So they might have been amongst that crowd. They may have heard him teach because they, they were probably alive when Jesus was just a month ago. So they're probably around and heard him teach. They might have seen his miracles. They might have even ate at the feeding of the 5,000. They might have witnessed certain miracles. But post-resurrection, what they're also seeing is completely, fully transformed Peter and John. And they've seen a healing done in the name of Jesus. Remember that some of your best mates who don't yet know Jesus... Some of the people who are closest to you that don't yet know Jesus, they're watching your life and they're seeing transformation happen and they might see that way before they even hear anything about the gospel, right? That the life that they see in front of them, as they see it transform, they're hearing something about the good news. I say like this, if you become a Christian and you're still a bit of an idiot at work a year later, you've got some work to do. <laughs> people should see some kind of transformation in your life if you're following Jesus. And what we're seeing with these guys is there's incredible transformation in Peter and John that people are starting to believe that Jesus isn't just a good idea. But if we put our faith and belief in Jesus, something radical might happen. The story continues. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law, so those three lots of group people, they met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, great name, and others of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? Now, if you've been to church for a little bit, then you might recognize some of those names, Annas and Caiaphas. Why do you recognize those names? Well, it was exactly these people who only a few weeks prior, Jesus himself had been marched in front of after his arrest and hand them over to the Romans to be executed. Remember this is sensitive, lovey-dovey John and wobbly, scared, kind of cowardly Peter, now in exactly the same predicament that Jesus was, in front of the same people who sentenced Jesus to death. And it seems like their life is going from bad to worse. And it seems like they may end up with the same fate as Jesus if they don't turn something around pretty quickly but without the immediate promise or confidence or bodily resurrection. So how do we, in 2024, keep going when things get really tough? When it feels like our life is going from bad to worse? When it feels like we've just got event after event of negative things just happening to us? How do we keep going when things get tough? Well, the first thing is this. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Peter's response to this scenario is super important for us to grab hold of. Because just a few chapters prior, in, um, a few weeks prior, we find this event in John 18, where Simon Peter has a very similar uh, encounter with very similar officials. And let's see that story. It says this. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. It's like that scene in Shrek. It's like, grab your pitchfork. Um, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked, what, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, called Peter in the, in the Acts of the Apostles, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. That servant's name was Malchus. It's worth naming him, isn't it? If you lose an ear to the cause, your name should be in the book. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then a detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Fix your eyes on Jesus. It's so easy when things get tough to reach for things that are in arm's reach, isn't it? 
We panic, so we pick up the car keys and just try and escape it and go for a long old drive. We pick up the phone and text round everyone, stirring up more panic. We pick up the TV remote and binge a TV program. We pick up, we reach for the fridge and eat our way through our pain. We reach for a bottle and drink our way through it. We pick up our laptop and escape into the dark corners of the internet. We reach for something close rather than fix our eyes on Jesus. Previously, when things got tough for Simon Peter, he reached for his sword rather than fixing his eyes on Jesus. If he had fixed his eyes on Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, was Jesus tense or fearful or preparing for a bus stop, pushing his chest up and flaring his nostrils? No. But then a few months later, look at Peter's response in almost exactly the same scenario, in front of the same people, Annas and Caiaphas, under arrest and potentially about to suffer terrible things. It says this. Then Peter... Filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you build as rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The same Simon Peter, unless he was like fencing with his sword as he was saying this stuff, I think it's a slightly different Simon Peter. Because the secret here is that Peter is no longer filled with rage, emotion, fear, or panic, or impulse. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that we may too be filled with so that when things get rough, when we feel against the ropes, it's the Spirit who points us towards Jesus. It's the Spirit who gives us courage, which literally means a change of heart. It's the Holy Spirit who renews and transforms us. When I was 28... I had to go to court for a couple of days to give personal testimony about a historical sexual abuse case that I had been one of seven victims of. And bringing up old memories and all that stuff took a horrendous toll on my mind and my energy. And yet every night while we were there, the court was next door to a cathedral. And I went along every night to a thing called Evensong, which is like a very traditional form of sung worship in the Anglican church. Normally, I would find it incredibly dull, Yet, when I went every night, two things happened. The first thing, I just felt held by God, felt cared for by God, I felt seen by God. And the second thing that happened is I was reminded every night of how far Jesus had brought me since then. And the gospel truth that says that the things in your life might define you, might describe you, sorry, but they no longer define you. They might make sense of who you are, but it's not your destination. Hebrews 12 puts it this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Fix your eyes on Jesus. The second thing we learn is to rely on his strength, not our own. The story continues. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed there standing with them, there was nothing they could say. Now, if you're anything like me, when the proverbial hits the fan... I go through like my internal resume, my internal CV, my internal LinkedIn page, and I think, what am I really good at and how can that fix the problem? Right? So something really awful happens and I think, well, I'm all right at this, I'm all right at that, then maybe I can fix or solve the problem very quickly. And more than a few times in my marriage, my wife Laura has said to me, in the midst of her telling me something very dramatic, Alex, I don't need your solutions, I just need you to listen. And I really messed up with this around COVID with our staff team here at Penny Lane. Because I'm such an optimist 
And I think that my sheer will can get us through most things. So nearly every day at, um, we'd come to work, including throughout the global pandemic, and I spent weeks saying to our team things like, isn't it great that we get to do church on Zoom? Isn't it amazing that we can't see each other face to face? Isn't it amazing that when we come and worship, we've got masks on and we can't sing together? Isn't it amazing that we can't see these people when we're planting a church? Isn't it incredible? Isn't everyone having the best time? And everyone's like, no, it's awful. I was like, yeah, but isn't it great because we're experiencing church in a whole new way? And they're like, no, it's terrible. And the thing is, is the problem was, is I, I just didn't really emotionally connect to the pain that was actually being felt by the staff team. And what's the problem here? I was relying on my own strength in the middle of adversity. I was thinking that my sheer optimism will solve all the problems a global pandemic presents. What I find incredibly encouraging about the Bible Peter and John are described as unschooled and ordinary. Who feels that either unschooled or ordinary, if not both? Hands up. Yeah, cool. Isn't, isn't that encouraging? Isn't that encouraging? In fact, the Latin, uh, the Greek, sorry, is agrammatos idiotai. Right? Idiotai. They were astonished, though. As people w- witnessed them, they didn't, they didn't witness their amazingness. They didn't witness their scholasticness. What they were amazed by and astonished by was that these men had been with Jesus. What a difference COVID would have been for our staff team if they had a pastor that was less busy rushing around trying to solve problems and more time being with Jesus. And what our workplaces or our families and friendship groups, what a difference they would be like if we spent so much time with Jesus that people start to become astonished and take note because we have been with him. Ultimately, it's a bit morbid, but on my gravestone, I don't want a list of my CV or my resume. I just love it to say he spent some time with Jesus. Relying on his words over us, not our own cleverness. The problem is sometimes when times are hard, we run in the opposite direction of Jesus. We put our head down and just crack on. And yet it's exactly the reverse that we need to go. Psalm 23, the most famous psalm in the Bible says this, he guides me along the right path for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Now, do you know what I recognize just in the past couple of weeks about this psalm? Those two verses, can you have them up again? Sorry, mate. It says this, he guides me along the right path for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley. Put those two together. That must mean that he sometimes guides us into the darkest valley. Right? Bible maths. And we know this because it's the Holy Spirit who leads Jesus into the wilderness, right? He leads him into the wilderness. But the good news is this. If you are in a dark valley, the good news is this. We don't need to fear evil because why? He is with us. He guides us into valleys, but he is always with us. When things are hard, we keep going by trusting in his strength, not our own. But also when things get hard, we need to remember who is on the throne, The story continues. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, which is like the religious court of the day, and then conferred together. They kind of got in a holy huddle, and they said this, what are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed the notable sign, and we cannot deny it. I love that. It's such a weird thing if you step back. All these religious people say, what are we going to do about it? They've performed a miracle, and we can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people... We must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again. All right, boys, Peter and John, you come back in. And they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, I'd love to know what those further threats were. Like no meals for, I don't know. Um, You're not allowed to play out. I don't know. Um, Any further threat, no switch time. Um, They let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened for the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. We need to remember When things get tough, who is on the throne? When we are going through hard times, it seems like the person who can resolve the issue is enthroned in our lives, right? So if it's a bill that comes through our door, 
and suddenly it's stressful and we don't know how to pay it. It feels like the gas company or whatever company it is, they start to dictate whether today is going to be a good one or a bad one. They become enthroned in our lives. When it's a work thing, your boss becomes the person who's going to be like the lord of your joy that day and therefore they become enthroned in your life. When it's a health scare, the doctor takes a main seat in your life. The thing is, in Acts, it would have been totally justifiable for Peter and John to place the concerns and needs of these guys, Annas and Caiaphas, front and center. And yet, what is their reply? Which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now, the thing is, the Bible says quite a lot about honoring those in authority, about praying for them and not seeking to dishonor them or speak ill of them. But it does also give us a clear chain of command. When your superior stops you from doing what God has commanded, or if your superior forces you to do something that God, or forces you to do something God has commanded you not to do, the chain of command is always God first. And here, Jesus, just a few weeks prior, had said this: "Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit, uh, of the Son and the Holy Spirit." And teach them to obey everything I've commanded to you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That command of Jesus, therefore, trumps everything else. That command trumps all of their desires. If something seeks to stop the discipling or the baptizing or the teaching of all nations, then God's word is going to trump it. When times get hard, remember who sits on the throne. Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who spoke creation into being, whose spirit hovered above the chaos and brought life and beauty from it. When times get hard, how else do we keep going? Never stop praying. It says this, Acts 4, 23 to 26. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voice together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. One of the main issues when everything goes wrong is we want to flee from anyone and everyone, don't we? We just want to curl up in a ball, put a duvet over our head, scream into our pillow. Away from people, I don't want more of their problems adding to mine. Away from work, it feels like more problems. Away from social gatherings, because there'll be at least one person who's so chirpy that it's almost offensive, and I can't be bothered with that. Away from God, because he's only going to ask us to do something more that I don't really have the energy for. And yet, after this brush with death, Peter and John run straight back to it told their own people, And when they'd heard the fact the Lord had brought them into safety, they raised their voices together and they pray. Psalm 133 says this, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on air. I mean, that's some weird language about anointing, basically. As if it was the Jew of Hermon, which is the Jew that God miraculously fed the Israelites when they're walking through the wilderness with. It's as if that Jew was falling on Mount Zion. For, where, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. When we come together, whether it's a Sunday or groups or alpha or trios, whatever it is, over a coffee, over a beer, and share where God is moving in our life, we are told that God bestows his blessing. I'm going to let you into a little pastoral secret, as long as you don't tell anyone else. Is that all right? When you're a pastor... There are the occasional times when me and my wife have had a rough day. It only happens occasionally. We might have had an argument like once a year. Uh, um, our kids might be irritating once every 10 or something. You know, uh, uh, and we look at our diary and we realize we've got a dinner engagement. Some people are coming over to us for dinner and so we're cooking or whatever. And we just don't have the energy for it. Do you know what I mean? Anyone else ever felt like that? Where you're like, you know what, I've got this thing in my diary I just don't have the energy for. Yet every time, we don't cancel it. <laughs> We do it, and every time, without fail, we become energized and blessed and thankful for the people who have rocked up. 
Because so often we think we are like the host and we need to be great and all that stuff and we're simply serving and yet so often we are served by people's presence. And it feels like, you know, Abraham hosts the angels. It's like all he was doing was putting out some food and the angels came to him and he spent time with them. And then sometimes they'll leave and we'll shut the door and be like, I'm so glad they came over. That just fed our soul in all kinds of ways. And so if things are going wrong, if things are going tough, we remember that sometimes it's exactly in community where God bestows his blessing. God will send his blessing when we dwell together in unity. So if things are going wrong, we fix our eyes on Jesus. We rely on his strength, we remember who is on the throne, and we pray. But what will happen if we do those things? Well, we're told this in Acts 4, 32 to 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. That's a vision Worth getting out of bed for, I think. Isn't it slightly compelling? Isn't that quite an exciting church community to be part of? That if people were literally of one heart and mind, that no one claimed their possessions their own and shared everything we had and moved in great power and God's grace was powerfully at work, like I want some of that, and there were no needy persons among them. You know, if there was no shame in the room. So that if you were in need, you could ask for help. I would love that, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you love the freedom to not have the shame that when you're really struggling, you could say to someone next to you, look, I'm really struggling and I'd like some help. Wouldn't that be amazingly liberating? Wouldn't it be incredible if people started to like sell their houses for the for kingdom expo- uh, exploits? Wouldn't that be incredible? Building a community here is a dream that one day we'll share heart and mind. That doesn't mean we'll all be exactly the same and all believe exactly the same thing. But the thing that we're, is motivating us and the way we see the world is through the same lens. We're sharing life together, but more than that, more than that, we're operating in power and seeing God's grace powerfully at work in all of us. And then an outpouring of generosity. That isn't because people feel convicted, but it's because it's an outpouring. Like when we experience generosity from God and from his people, the only, the only response of that is more generosity. We see an outpouring of generosity so that our community, our city, and our nation is also impacted with the knowledge and love of Christ. But it all starts not with a strategy. It all start, starts not with a branding. It doesn't start with an Instagram account. It all starts with them being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's kind of the conclusion of nearly every chapter of the book of Acts. (laughs) Spoiler alert for the rest of the series. It all starts with being filled with the Spirit. There's two amazing books recently that have come out. um, One's called Dominion by Tom Holland. and Another is called uh, 3,000 Years... uh, no, the first 2,000 years of Christian history. Um, I mean, they're dense. I'm not going to recommend you listen to them unless you've got 16 hours free on audio. Um, but both of them, they're written by great historians, but they miss out in both of them the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they try and work out that uh, why did this church grow? Why did 5,000 get added to the number? And then 3,000, and then 2,000, and then why, why is the church booming in a world that is hostile to it? It's because the Holy Spirit. Why are we seeing these miracles? Oh, it's because of the Holy Spirit. Why are we then seeing the, the, the gospel translate across cultures where no religion had done that before? It's because of the Holy Spirit. It's all because of the Holy Spirit. And we're told time and time again, all these accounts, they start with people being filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's what we need to do, right? 